Hey guys, how's it going? It's Dylan from Chess Lifestyle, and today it is negative one degree outside um, Fahrenheit. Ridiculously cold. Um, there are power outages uh, in some parts of the country. So I thought this would be a nice opportunity to uh, show a nice blitz game that I played a couple weeks ago. And this game, the reason I like it is because uh, it features a large space advantage that I got, as well as some slow positional maneuvering play, which uh, is typical of my style and um, is part of the reason why I like chess so much. So um, let's get right into it. I'm white here, and I played an English opening. Black played a little bit passively with bishop e7, um, but it's still OK. After castles, I play e4, trying to stop this d5 advance. And here, black made the first pretty large mistake, which was knight e8, uh, which is a misguided prophylactic attempt to prevent e5 coming with tempo. But this is misguided because um, after black plays something like c5, if I were to play e5 here, this is not a good move because after knight e8, d3, for example, uh, after d6, it's pretty clear that this pawn on e5 is overextended, and I don't think white can hope for much of an advantage here. So going back um, after knight e8, I'm not going to play e5, but instead I take the full center with d4. And here, if f5 was the idea uh, of knight e8, then I'm just going to play e5, and um, it's woefully obvious for black that the knight on e8 has been misplaced, and white just has a sizable advantage. Honestly, c5 should probably be preferred here, taking his fair share of the center, but after d5, uh, this position resembles a Benoni, where black hasn't fiancettered the dark-squared bishop and has a poor knight on e8. So this is just clearly inferior, but probably was still black's best option. Uh, instead, black chose d6, and after knight f3, um, this knight would probably be better on e2, just keeping the possibility to castle and play f4 one day. But uh, I chose d6, knight f3, and after knight d7, castles, black finally took his share of the center with e5. And here, a lot of people might blindly take the space with d5, but I think this is a little bit premature because... Um, the best way to take advantage of um, passive development is not to close the position, turning it into a slow, slower game. The best way is to continue to develop your pieces naturally and add pressure to the position. So that's what I did, bishop e3. And f6, <coughs> another pretty bad move because it's kind of funny, this, uh, this pawn triangle here is just sort of the wrong pawn, pawn triangle. Um, it takes away a lot of blacks. Um, active squares for his pieces, um, particularly the f6 square for a knight. But um, if black's pawns were here on c6, d5, e6, this would be the proper pawn triangle. And um, actually, in that position, black might just be equal because um, black would have the f6 square available for a knight. So after f6, I played knight h4, uh, preparing to come into f5 one day. And black goes... Uh, knight b6, clearing the way to be able to capture on f5 with the bishop if I were to hop in right away. Uh, but instead, I played queen e2, just continuing to develop. And now, he plays g5, sort of hoping um, I'll go knight f5, I suppose. Um, but funny, funnily enough, this is actually the strongest move. Um, this is not what I played in the game. I played knight f3. But after knight f5, if black were to take here, this is what I was afraid of. Uh, having this potentially vulnerable uh, pawn on f5. But after a sample line c6, because b7 was hanging, rook a d1, queen c8 uh, hitting the f5 pawn, black doesn't have time to take, because after takes takes, I go f4. And if black were to take here, I have a skewer on the rook and the queen. So there's just simply no time to um, to really effectively target this pawn on f5. Uh, and meanwhile, all of his pieces are um, miscoordinated and passive. Furthermore, a feature of allowing this trade on uh, f5 is that now white has this really juicy e4 post for a knight. And uh, this is going to give black some issues. So <clears throat> I should have just gone in with f5, but this was a blitz game. I was afraid of the weak pawn, so I played knight f3, which is still, it still leaves me with a sizable advantage. After bishop e6, the most natural developing move for the bishop, <clears throat> now and only now I play d5, taking space, and uh, it comes with tempo. And after a further bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, g4, I take even more space. And after the bishop 
uh, retreats to G6 here. Um, if you want to pause your video and try to find the move I played here, it's not the engine's top choice, but I think it's the most direct and to the point. It also highlights one of Black's potentially weak squares. So the move that I played here was H4, with the idea of pushing on with H5 and taking even more space. And for example, if Black takes this pawn, then we're going to take with a knight, and again, we're threatening to come in on F5. If he plays some random move like C6, we come into F5, and if he, if he were to chop this knight on F5, we would always take with the E pawn, whereupon we have this nice E4 square um, for a knight, and Black has problems. But instead, he chose to uh, keep solid with h6, after which I take even more space with h5. And I heard a, um, a strong player in a lecture one time say that um, if you're able to achieve two solid pawns, um, stable pawns, on your opponent's fifth rank in your opponent's territory, uh, as long as you have an active play afterwards and the uh, position's not completely locked up, you're just going to be positionally winning. And that is the case here. Um, White has some prospects for active play on the queen side, and black is just um, pretty much busted here. So after rook fd1 and a6, um, we should note that the kingside pawn structure has evolved into a static space advantage for white, and this allows um, for some slower play. And here I took advantage of that by uh, starting a plan which improves one of my pieces. So if you'd like to pause your video and uh, think about what you should play here, go for it. And here I started a long-winded uh, knight maneuver with knight h2. And the idea is knight h2 to f1 to g3 to f5. And from there, it's going to put a lot of pressure on black's position. Um, so well done if you found this. I went knight h2. And after knight d7, I continue with knight f1. And after b6, I take some time out to um, grab some more queenside space with b4. And this also happens to take away the c5 square from the knight. Oops, the c5 square from the knight. Black continued with a5, and here, this is a pretty critical moment because white has a lot of options. So if you would like to pause your video one more time, um, try to think about how you would react to this a5 move. Would you push on with b5? Would you defend with a3? Would you take the pawn, or would you defend the pawn some other way? And here, I think the best option is to go a3, uh, just keeping the tension, and if black ever takes, we'll just recapture, and we're going to be able to control the a file because of um, black's very poor coordination on the back rank. And furthermore, b5 is just a terrible uh, positional move because not only does it give the c5 square to the knight, but it shuts down all our active play on the queen side, which is where we are going to try to prove an advantage. So even though b5 leaves us with three stable pawns on uh, in our opponent's territory, uh, b5 would actually be a big mistake because we're left with no active play. Um, so instead, a3 is the best and um, after a further knight g7, knight g3, and queen b8, um, black is really running out of moves. Um, and particularly, we can notice that these four minor pieces are pretty unhappy, they're passive, and it's actually a rarity to see a, um, a position in a, in a middle game like this um, with the, the board locked up where no minor pieces have been exchanged. And this is very bad news for black because you never want to have a lot of pieces on the board with a space disadvantage. So after queen b8, I remaneuver the bishop to aim towards the queen side so that one day it could um, become more active than it was on g2. And um, black took on b4. And after queen b7, I have to try to find a way to avoid too many simplifications on the a file because that's really um, an important asset in my position, in my um, attempt for an advantage. So uh, the move I played here was knight b5, which points out that after rook takes a1, rook a1, black can't just mindlessly play rook a8 because the uh, c7 pawn is hanging. <clears throat> so instead here, black played rook b8. Black's pieces have really no active plans, and um, White is going to continue uh, with queen a2 and infiltrate on a7 and put a lot of pressure on c7. So that's what I did with queen a2. And after some further moves, I remaneuver my bishop so that it can be more active on the, uh, the a4, e8 diagonal. And after knight f8, um, black is hoping to uh, trade some minor pieces. And we can't really avoid this, but... Uh, it's important to know which minor pieces to exchange. And here, uh, a very instructive move is knight c3. 
Again, not the engine's top move, but I think it's definitely the best. Uh, after knight c3, we avoid bishop takes b5, um, which would trade off one of our knights, and we know that knights are stronger in closed positions, so I want to um, avoid this exchange. But after, well, okay, so c6 was played in the game, and we'll get back to that, but after black plays something else like king f7, can't really find a better move. Um, my plan was to play bishop a4, and this has the merit of exchanging black's only active minor piece. Um, and after queen takes a4, queen c8, we hold the possession, uh, position together with f3. And then we're able to get our knight back to b5 with a lot of pressure. We're infiltrating on a7. And um, there are some really instructive lines here I want to go through before uh, returning to the, to the game. But I do want to emphasize that it was highly preferable for us to exchange our bishop for um, black's bishop on e8 rather than our knight. Again, it's really hard to figure out what black should do here. If black um, tries to come to the defense of the queen side with the king, king e7, then already we have um, knight a7, and we're coming into c6 with devastating effect. So instead, if king g8, the, uh, the game could continue queen a7, takes, takes, and there's a lot of pressure on c7. Black has to find out a way to do something about this. And if knight e8, for example, um, black is already running into a lot of issues with knight f5, the knight on G7 here is doing an important role on keeping um, keeping our own knight out of f5. Because if we were to play knight f5 um, with a knight on g7, he would just take. And um, it's clear that our knight on g3 is better than the knight on g7. <clears throat> so we're waiting for that knight to move away in order to come in to f5. So the knight can't really move away from g7 because, because if it goes to e8, we're hopping in here. Yeah, black really has no good moves. If he tries to defend the pawn here, uh, we're just going to be able to take on d6 um, because of the pin here. So if rook c8 defending the c7 pawn, the engine prefers rook b7, which has the idea of bringing the knight to a7 to c6, and then we're going to one day take on d8. And after rook takes, this pawn is finally falling on c7. But after rook b7, uh, rook a8, uh, yes, we can take the pawn here, but I didn't really like allowing rook a1 and, um, I mean, black should, white should still be completely winning here. Um, there's not much a lone rook can do in a position like this, and um, we should just be easily winning. But uh, I didn't like allowing any sort of semblance of counterplay. I prefer the slow plan of king f2, bringing the king all the way over to the queen side in order to eventually one day go through with this um, rook b7, knight a7 idea um, without allowing rook a8 and uh, entry on the queen side. Uh, so after king f2, um, black has to be really careful about what he does. I'll, actually, this is pretty much zugzwang, because if knight d7, like, it's really the only move he can think about with his minor pieces, uh, then already white has knight takes d6 because of this pin on the c-pawn. Um, and if uh, king h8, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, eventually we get our uh, king to b3 here, and uh, then we go rook b7 with the same idea. And after knight e8, adding more defense, then we come into f5, and this is an actual zug swamp. Black's three minor pieces, well, all of his pieces are on the back rank. Um, just a beautiful position, and uh, furthermore, this h-pawn is hanging and cannot be protected. If he tries to protect it here, we're just going to take on d6, and um, after takes, takes, this pawn is pinned. So yeah, it's a pretty miserable position for black. But instead of allowing uh, this trade of the light squared bishops on a4, black decided um, for c6. And um, after infiltrating on the seventh rank, um, after a couple trades, I have this uh, nice d5 outpost. The rook comes into a8. And here, uh, rook a7 would have been uh, even nicer than uh, what I played in the game because it um, just controls everything. But I traded here, seeing that I could win a pawn on b6. And um, after a few more moves um, here, my bishops hit, and I was getting low on time. But I did some quick calculation, and I went ahead and took here on f6 with check. And after taking the bishop and allowing uh, black to take my bishop on d3, I take another pawn, and I secure my knight safely on f5. And my queenside pawns are just going to roll up the board, and I have pressure here as well. So this is, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm three pawns up and just completely winning here. And after some further moves, which are probably not the most accurate, but still fine, 
I took on h6, seeing that I would have a lot of pressure on all of black's remaining pawns. And now this pawn is just going to queen, and there's not much black can do about it. For example, after knight d5, king c5, this nice move knight d7 finishes the job because black can't really take because of h7, and queening is unstoppable. So after the king moves, I just win a knight, and black here resigned. So some of the takeaways of this game are not to play too reactively to your opponent's moves uh, in the opening to, for fear of um, getting into a passive and worse position. For example, knight e8 here was a big mistake uh, because e5 was not really a threat. Number two, uh, we keep the tension in the center until it actually pays for us to play d5 with tempo. Number three, we play directly here with h4 uh, with the idea of getting more space with h5 or uh, bringing the knight into this nice f5 square. Number four, um, noting that the position is locked uh, allows for slow maneuvers. We improve all of our pieces to their optimal squares, and I did this in the game via uh, knight h2 to f1 to g3 to f5. Number five, again, after a5, we keep the tension with a3. Instead of playing b5, which would take more space, but would uh, leave us with no active plans. And finally, number six here, we... Uh, avoid the trade of bishop for knight by playing knight c3 with the idea of bishop a4 and trading off the right set of minor pieces for us. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with this game. I think it's um, an example of some pretty high quality chess uh, for a blitz game comparatively to how I normally play in faster time, time controls. So I was pretty proud of this game and I uh, hope you learned something from it. So I'll see you next time and uh, stay warm. Bye.